Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communications, and welcome to NASA headquarters. Asteroids are a popular subject these days, and today we'll get up close and personal with the giant asteroid Vesta, courtesy of NASA's Dawn spacecraft. We'll have brief presentations and then open it up for questions. And you can follow us on the internet at www.nasa.gov slash dawn. And something we're doing to be included in science press conferences is using the incredible reach and audience of social media. So join the conversation. Ask a question at hashtag AskNASA. And of course, you can follow us on the other NASA social media sites that include Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and others. Before I introduce today's speakers, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Green, Director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, to give us, give us some opening remarks. Dr. Green? Thank you very much, Dwayne. It's indeed a pleasure to come and talk about some of the exciting science results that we'll hear about today. But I want to take you back 50 years before we start. And, and consider this, 50 years ago, we only understood the solar system by analyzing the light from the back of a telescope. So this is indeed our 50th anniversary of planetary science. NASA put in place a whole series of programs that allowed us to launch satellites in far reaches of our solar system, from Mercury all the way out to the outer reaches of our, our environment. And over those years, we've made some exciting discoveries. The Discovery Program, which started 20 years ago and have launched now 11 missions, brings that excitement really to a focus. And today's mission, Dawn, really exemplifies the exciting principle investigator science that's accomplished through this program. We're really so delighted uh, with the results, knowing that there's more to follow as Dawn begins another journey. But for now, let's get going and let me turn it back over to Duane to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Jim. Let's learn about VESTA. Let me introduce today's speakers, starting with Carol Raymond, Dawn, Deputy Principal Investigator, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Hap McSween, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Vishnu Reddy, a Dawn Framing camera team member from the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Germany and the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. David O'Brien, Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. Christina De Sanctis, a Dawn co-investigator Invisible and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer Team Lead from the Italian National Institute for Astrophysics in Rome. And with that, I'll turn it over to Carol. Thank you, Duane. We're all delighted to be here today um, to talk to you about Don's first results from VESTA. Don's mission at VESTA has been a spectacular success. And it's transformed VESTA from a fuzzy orb into a planetary body which has exceeded our expectations in many ways that we'll be talking about today. Dawn's data provide the first comprehensive analysis of Vesta's global properties and provide a firm link between meteorites that have fallen to Earth and their parent body, Vesta. Um, may I have the first graphic? The Vesta is a very special and unique object. It's the second most massive asteroid and the, one of the brightest asteroids in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. Its enormous size relative to other asteroids that have been visited uh, is shown in this montage. 
And as we'll describe today, VESA exhibits many characteristics that define it more as a, a, a body that is transitional between asteroids and planets than um, being more like your garden variety asteroid. The collection of six papers that are being published in Science describe Vesta's colorful and diverse surface and the planetary processes that have shaped the body since its formation. In the second graphic, this montage uh, emphasizes that Vesta's history appears to be more similar to rocky terrestrial planets, Mars, Mercury, and the Earth's moon than to its larger sibling, the dwarf planet Ceres, which will be the second target of the Dawn mission. Dawn's data have enabled the history of Vesta to be defined. It formed within two million years after the first solids formed in the solar system. Before Ceres formed, before the terrestrial planets formed, and when the concentration of radioactive material with short decay times generated enough heat inside Vesta to cause melting. We now know that Vesta is the only intact layered planetary building block surviving from the very early, earliest days of the solar system. Vesta is also very special because there is a class of meteorites, the Howardite, Eukrite, Diogenites, that have been linked to Vesta by telescopic observations. So Dawn is unique because it's the first time that a spacecraft has been able to visit an object known to be the source of samples after those samples were identified. We've had pieces of Vesta under study in the laboratory for decades, but are now only getting out to, uh, to know the parent body. And Hap and Christina are going to be talking more about that. Um, in the next graphic, I show um, some of the results of our mission. Um, Dawn measured Ma Vesta's mass very accurately and mapped its topography and gravity in great uh, precision and resolution. The topography is shown here at the top as a color contoured 3D map. And it's illustrating that Vesta has a very rugged topography. And it also displays very steep slopes, much steeper than is seen um, on uh, planetary bodies. And this has um, been a, a, a big factor in uh, the types of uh, morphologies that we see on the surface. The gravity field is shown color contoured at the bottom. Dawn's gravity and topography reveal the internal density structure of Vesta and can have confirmed that Vesta has a concentration of mass at its center, proving that it is a differentiated body with an iron core, a silicate mantle, and a less dense basaltic crust, the same as Mercury and Mars, the Earth and the Moon. In my last graphic, um, this is a, a cutaway view of Vesta's internal structure. And assuming that the core is made of the same material as iron nickel meteorites, um, we can uh, use the gravity data to derive the size of the core, which is at about 70 miles in radius, or about 40% of the radius of the body, or about 18% of the mass of the body. Dawn's evidence for the differentiated nature of the interior of Vesta confirms conjectural <laughs> theories based on the HED meteorites um, and therefore increases the value of those samples for studying the early the processes in the early solar system. Vesta is special because it survived the intense collisional environment of the main asteroid belt for billions of years, allowing us to interrogate a key witness to the events at the very beginning of the solar system. We believe Vesta is the only intact member of a family of similar bodies that have since perished. I'll turn it over to Hap to tell you more about the HED meteorite collection connection. Thank you, Carol. The synergy of spacecraft exploration and samples that can be analyzed in the laboratory has markedly enhanced what we understand about the moon. Vesta is special because we already have its sample in the form of hundreds of meteorites. I'd like to talk a little bit about how Dawn confirms this connection between the asteroid and rocks that fell from the sky. Could I have my first slide? Making this connection is a recurrent theme of our new science papers. Next slide, please. The Howardite, Eukrite, Diogenite meteorites, that's a mouthful. We normally say HED meteorites. 
are, are seen here as viewed through a microscope. The HEDs are a complex assortment of rocks whose properties indicate that some of them erupted on the surface as lavas, some of them cooled and crystallized slowly at depth uh, in a large uh, parent body. Next slide, please. At 325 miles across, Vesta is certainly a large parent body. This false color map of dawn framing camera band ratios illustrates the Vesta surface is compositionally heterogeneous, like the HED meteorites and unlike the small asteroids that we have previously visited by spacecraft. Another indication that a large body produced the HEDs is its protracted impact history. Next slide, please. Most of these meteorites are breaches, that is, rocks assembled from broken fragments, as you can see on the left. And that is most readily accomplished in a large gravity field. The squiggles on the right show that these breaches were created by impacts over a period of perhaps a billion years. And the repeated impacts are recorded by resetting of some radioactive isotope clocks in the meteorites that can be analyzed. Next, please. The ancient age of Vesta's surface is revealed by Dawn's new high-resolution images of heavily cratered terrains, as you can see uh, in this image, especially in the northern part of the image. The radiometric ages of the HED meteorites record their crystallization from magmas four and a half billion years ago and the density of craters in the northern region is consistent with that age. The next slide will show you the spectrum of sunlight reflected from Vesta and recorded by Dawn's Veer instrument. That spectrum, shown in white, closely resembles the laboratory spectra of the various HEDs, especially the Howardites, which are samples most likely to have resided on the surface of Vesta. More importantly, the map locations of Veer spectral types make perfect geologic sense. Next slide shows a map of Vesta's South Pole region, and it illustrates the depth of the one micron band, which is a proxy for the proportion of diogenite. The eucrites, which formed on the surface, are concentrated in terrains outside of this region, and the diogenites, which formed deep underground, are only uh, exposed where they have been excavated in large craters, like the Rhea Silvia Basin, which is shown here and which Dave will talk about a little later. Finally, Don's new measurements of Vesta's bulk density and gravity allow us to reconstruct models of its unseen interior. The next slide. Uh, shows you Carroll's diagram uh, that indicates that Vesta has a large iron heart with a radius of about 70 miles. A substantial core is predicted for the HED parent body because they are depleted in metallic elements. And models for the HED parent body that are based on the properties of the HED meteorites predict a core of about this size. So Don's observations have convinced most of us, certainly me, that Vesta is the HED parent body. With this link more firmly established, we're now using measurements of the HEDs to complement Don's uh, remote sensing data and to help us interpret it better. The takeaway message is that we are now unraveling the geologic history of Vesta in ways that would not be possible without samples. I'd now like to pass it on to uh, Vishnu, who will talk about Dawn's new color images. Thank you, Hep. Uh, so color images obtained by the Dawn framing camera basically shows that Vesta is unlike any other object we've visited so far in the solar system. And there are a few points I would like you to take away from uh, my presentation here today. Uh, the first thing is that on Vesta, we see a wide range of brightness variation. Uh, the, so we see areas that are as bright as snow and areas that are as dark as coal. The second point I would like to make is that we see no evidence for its original crust, all the volcanic features we expect uh, see from the HED meteorites, we don't see any evidence of it. 
And the reason we think is that most of Vesta's original primitive crust has been uh, affected by impacts and all the original material has been pulverized and mixed together. The third point I'd like to make is that uh, we have identified different colored units uh, within Vesta's uh, surface different, at different topographic levels. And this is evidence for an internal structure just like Happen, uh, Carol pointed out. And the most interesting part about this is that the lowest point of the South Pole Rio Selvia Basin also so shows a concentration of these diogenite meteorites. Uh, these are the meteorites we think came from the lower crust or probably the upper mantle of Vesta. So there's a correlation between composition and topography. Uh, the other thing we also want to share is that we don't find any evidence for olivine so far in the resolution of the images we've looked at. The final point I would like to make is that while Vesta has a lot of similarities with the moon, you know, the next largest differentiated object that we have in the inner solar system, apart from Vesta, there's some key differences. On the moon, what we see is that we have a clear correlation between topography and albedo. Typically, the lunar highlands are brighter than the, the, the lunar mare. But in Vesta, we don't see this clear correlation. And part of it, the reason could be the way the impact processes have affected it. Since we don't see the original crust of Vesta, the impact processes have pulverized and mixed all these different units, and we don't see that. With that, I'd like to show a couple of videos uh, to in illustrate my ideas. Uh, here you see a beautiful image uh, uh, that has been wrapped on the shape model of Vesta, and Dave created this uh, video of it. Uh, what you see here are the famous uh, snowman craters. Uh, the largest crater there is a, the Marcia crater, which is approximately 60 kilometers across. And these are framing camera filters that are in the infrared. Uh, these are the wavelengths which typically we human beings won't see. Uh, I would say the closest thing that could actually sense an image like this is a rattlesnake. So if we had a snake snuck aboard Dawn, you would probably see an image like this uh, of Vesta. And th this shows some important uh, in information. As you can see, this topographic lows within the large Marcia crater that is bright compared to the topographic highs, which are darker. Uh, if you go to the next video, please. The next video shows uh, something slightly different. Here, what we have are color ratio uh, images. Uh, what we have taken is we've so taken these different filters and we've ratioed them so we get more scientific information about uh, the surface of Vesta. What you see here is a 34 kilometer uh, diameter uh, crater named Opia. And it has this bright red ejecta that, uh, that is coming out of this crater. And we're not really sure what this red ejecta is at this point, but we probably think it's related uh, either to the impactor that affected it or probably something uh, that it was excavated from within Vesta itself. So we, we get some uh, really cool, not only real cool images, but also we get some important scientific information from this. So uh, most of the science we've done so far has been uh, using uh, HAMO data, which is approximately 60 kilometers per pixel. Uh, we right now have LAMO images, which are at 16 uh, meters per pixel. Uh, so we're continuing to do really cool science, and uh, we hope to have uh, many more exciting results to come. So with that, I'll pass on to Dave O'Brien, my colleague here. Okay. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, so as noted previously, uh, Vesta dates back to the beginning of the solar system. And given its location in the asteroid belt, it's been recording impacts from asteroids ever since that point, uh, making it a very important object to study as we're trying to reconstruct the dynamical history and collisional history of the solar system. Uh, the first slide shows a global map of um, the surface of Vesta from the framing camera data. Uh, showing a wide range of craters of all kinds of degradation states, from very young, fresh craters uh, to very old, degraded craters. Uh, we've cataloged um, close to 2,000 craters um, larger than two and a half miles on the surface and um, are using those to help unravel um, the surface history of Vesta. Uh, the larger craters are sometimes difficult to pick out from the images alone. Uh, the next slide will show the uh, global topography map um, in this map, uh, blue is low elevation and red is high elevation. Uh, we can pick out a number of, um, of large depressions, uh, seven of which I circled on this map. Uh, these are the seven most prominent um, impact basins. There may be others as well. Some of the other low areas are um, of uncertain origin. Uh, one thing to note here is um, in this image, and it's more clear in the, the next slide as well, uh, the two largest impact basins are in the South Polar region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the Rea Silvia Basin and the Venenia Impact Basin, about 300 and 250 miles across, uh, respectively, which are in the South Polar region. 
Uh, one of the new results from Dawn is that we've been able to use our global crater catalogs that have been created um, to count the numbers of small craters on these uh, impact basins and estimate an age of them. Uh, Rhea Silvia Basin has a surprisingly young age of about one billion years old. Uh, the Venenia Basin, uh, which lies partially underneath the Rhea Silvia Basin, has an age of about two, year, two billion years old or possibly somewhat older. Uh, since Rhea Silvia formed on top of it, it erased some of the craters on Venenia, so it's difficult to get an exact age. So two billion years is a lower limit for that one. Uh, the, the relatively young ages of both of these basins is in stark contrast to what we find on the moon, where all of the old basins are at least three and a half billion years old. Uh, this is telling us that there, uh, the dynamical history in these two different parts of the solar system the, and the collisional uh, history experienced by the Moon and Vesta um, is surprisingly different. Uh, this is um, telling us something about the dynamical history of the solar system, and it's a complex story that we're really only beginning to unravel. Um, in the next slide, um, you'll see how the, the relatively young uh, formation age of the Rhea Silvia Basin uh, has influenced the surface and led to a strong north-south dichotomy on Vesta. Uh, this image shows a, um, a one-quarter of Vesta's surface, sort of a, um, a wedge cut out of it, um, all the way from south to north. In the bottom, you'll see in the southern hemisphere um, the Rhea Silvia rim. And towards the north, um, where it's dark, is where we uh, don't currently have data because that part of Vesta is still in shadow. Uh, you'll notice that in the south, uh, there's many, um, uh, there's very sharp topography and relatively few craters. As you move towards the north, um, there's a lot more craters. It's a very densely cratered surface. And also the topography is smoother and more eroded. Um, this is because the formation of Rhea Silvia um, underneath the crater itself and outside of the crater for, um, for um, hundreds of miles um, covered that area in ejected material, essentially resetting the surface. So most of what we see in the south is really only about a billion years old. As we go towards the north, that's the much more ancient terrain of Vesta. The um, following movie, um, or the movie that um, is showing now, um, shows a, a view going into the um, South Pole Basin. Um, again, red is high and blue is low here. This is uh, based on the global topography models. Um, you'll see that there's a relatively high area surrounding the crater, um, the, the reddish rim in most areas, where there's a gap is actually where the Venenia Basin um, is overlapped by Rhea Silvia. Uh, you'll notice in the center a very pronounced central peak, um, and also an interesting spiral and grooved pattern on the floor of the Rhea Silvia Basin. Uh, the uh, central mound um, was somewhat surprising at first um, because it's much larger in proportion to the crater size than um, impact crater uh, central peaks that we see on the moon, for example. Uh, the next slide shows a view uh, from the rim of Rhea, Rhea Silvia uh, looking into the um, crater. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, here you can see a, a prominent scarp um, or, or cliff off to the right um, of the image, part of the rim of Rhea Silvia. In the center is a central mound. The top is actually imaging data wrapped over the topography, and the bottom is just the color-coded topography. Uh, the central mound of Rhea Silvia is about uh, one-third of the diameter of the crater itself. Uh, at first, this was very surprising because craters on the moon and, and other large bodies don't really look like this. Uh, when we've looked at other um, smaller bodies in the solar system, like outer solar system satellites, uh, we've found that they actually have a similar structure with a very um, dome-like, very large central peak. Uh, this appears to be a consequence of craters forming on a body where the crater is almost as large as the body itself. So the planetary curvature really starts to um, play a role in the shape of the crater. Uh, we've been able to use the global topography models uh, to make estimates of what the volume of the Rhea Silvia Basin is. Um, in the next slide, um, we show um, a, a similar figure again, and our estimate of about 250,000 cubic miles of material excavated from Rhea Silvia. Um, a large part of this material will remain on the surface, as I noted previously, erasing uh, many pre-existing craters in the south. Um, but a large fraction of this as well is ejected into space. Um, to put this into another perspective, 250,000 cubic miles is enough to fill the Grand Canyon about 1,000 times over. So this is a very large volume of material. Uh, the amount of material ejected into space from uh, the Rhea Silvia impact is more than enough to explain the number of uh, Vesta family asteroids that we see um, in space. These Vesta family asteroids are very important because they're essentially an intermediate link between the surface of Vesta and the HCD meteorites that we have here on Earth. 
Um, so um, another interesting point about this is that independent estimates of the age of that Vesta family put it at about a billion years. So the fact that we're finding a billion year age for Rhea Silvia, which coincides with this estimate of the age of the uh, Vesta um, asteroid family, really kind of ties the whole dynamical story together. Um, so not only is the Dawn mission telling us that um, it, Vesta is the HED parent body, it's also solidifying the dynamical link between um, the uh, surface of Vesta and the bodies that we have on Earth that we're studying as meteorites. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, hand it off to Christina, who will talk more about the composition of Vesta in the Rhea Silvia Basin. Thank you, Dave. So uh, Dawn demonstrates that Vesta is a small differentiated planet, and uh, we see very deep down into Vesta crust, and possibly also down to its mantle. We clearly see different minerals on Vesta, and they are the same that we have in our hands as meteorites, eucrites, awardite, and diogenites. Their global distribution tells us that Vesta would have been a magma ocean early in its history. And these new findings give us a windows in the process that formed the earliest body of the solar system. And in the next slide, you will see how the, the distribution of these minerals tell us about the Vesta history. This, uh, Color images, false color images, has been taken with the visible infrared mapping spectrometer. We use only three colors of the uh, more than 800 uh, channels of this imaging spectrometer. And uh, you see that there is a clear dichotomy between the northern equatorial region, the southern um, bluish region. And in the next slide, you see that uh, these uh, two regions correspond to different composition, and this composition tells us uh, uh, about the uh, process that formed Vesta. The the, the, for instance, the blue carb that corresponds to the South Polar region tells us that uh, we have uh, uh, typical minerals like diogenites. And uh, these uh, mm, minerals are made uh, uh, by rocks uh, formed via uh, magmatism. In the next slide, you see how these uh, uh, minerals are distributed on the vast surface. The violet means that we have uh, uh, more diogenite-like mineralogies, while the um, yellow means that we have more eucrite-like uh, uh, lithologies. And the imaging spectrometer data tell us that uh, the region of Rhea Silvia Basin is richer in diogenites, that is a mineral formed in deep crust, while in the uh, more uh, um, equatorial region we have a prevalence of eucritic uh, minerals. And so we think that uh, overall the mineralogy north-south diversity indicates that deep crust was exposed by the Rhea Silvia impacts. And, uh, the, um, the region in the equatorial northern part of Vesta uh, seems to retain the most ancient rich uh, mineralogy, rich eucritic mineralogies. And uh, in the next slide, you see how this uh, large scale uh, variation is also uh, uh, seen in a smaller scale. So this is a false color image made by Vir. And this, uh, mm, if you look uh, at this uh, uh, variegated uh, uh, surface, you see that we have a lot of uh, uh, different morphology, and this different morphology corresponds to uh, different colors. So if we look in the box, so in the next slide you will see in, uh, a zoom on this box. This is the Oppia crater, and these three images has been done in order to highlight different uh, things. The first one is the brightness in the visible wavelengths, and you see that we have a bright region and darker region while the central panel is made uh, using different color combination and highlights the different uh, rock type and the ejected material from the, from the crater. So you see the ejecta on one side of the crater that is completely different with respect to the rest of the materials. And the last uh, uh, figure is done in order to see the variation in the pyroxene abundance. Pyroxene is really important because it tells us about the history of Vesta, the evolution of Vesta. So and, uh, to, um, to conclude, next slide, please. 
the local skill variation with the fact that uh, we have also this global diversity on Vesta uh, tell us that uh, the Vesta class could be a complex uh, mix, uh, mixture of Diogenes and Eucharist. But uh, the uh, occurrence of a greater proportion of diogenetic material in the South Polar region deeply excavated tell us that uh, this uh, could, uh, that uh, this is a critical find and is broadly consistent with the, the possibility that Vesta was uh, melted early in its solar system. And these uh, uh, new results allow additional insight in the, in the process that formed the early solar system. And now we will go back to Carol that will uh, give us some uh, remarks. So thank you. I hope um, we uh, conveyed how excited we are about this new data and its significance. And I just wanted to wrap up um, with a few key points. Um, and uh, the first is that um, Vesta is an uh, intact protoplanetary body that is transitional between asteroids and planets. Um, the Vesta is the parent body of the HED meteorites, which allows us to interpret dawn data in far greater depth than would otherwise be possible. Uh, that Vesta has displayed unexpectedly large brightness variations, and that the giant Rhea Silvia basin is significantly younger than uh, large impact basins on the moon. And this was also unexpected and provides fundamental constraints on models of the dynamics of the solar system. And uh, that wraps up our remarks. Okay, well, thank you all. Okay, now it's time for questions. And again, I want to welcome our social media audience. And if you have a question, bring them on in at hashtag AskNASA. And the conversation will not stop here, ladies and gentlemen. The Twitter feed, and I will give that out at the end of the show. You can join the conversation and ask questions in the conversation with the scientists and the team. So stand by for that. But right now, we're going to open the phone lines, and then we're going to take some questions from our social media audience. And first up will be Mike Walls. Oh, hi. This is, this is Mike Wall from Space.com. I guess this, this is for Carol. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Vesta is probably the, the, the you know, last surviving member of, of a class of objects that used to exist in the solar system. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what happened to the rest of those objects and sort of where does Ceres fit into that picture? Uh, sure. Um... We, we know that from the, uh, the debris field that's left in the asteroid belt, um, indicating there, there were other bodies that were differentiated similar to Vesta. We know this because there are iron meteorites that look like the cores of these bodies, uh, stony meteorites that look like the crusts of these bodies, and with um, compositions which are you know, roughly similar. So we could, uh, we could infer and based on that and, and just um, our ideas about how the early solar system um, formed, that there were many of these uh, planetary embryos that were coalescing and forming the, um, the rocky planets and the cores of the gas giants. So um, it's, it, but what's clear to us is that Vesta appears to be the only intact uh, protoplanet that's left because um, there, the collisional environment was, was so intense that many of these were just blasted into small pieces, um, which is what most of the belt is. So as far as Ceres, um, Ceres is also, um, it, it's not a, an igneously differentiated body. It still has a lot of its water, um, and so it has, a, has had a significantly different evolution than Vesta and the other um, planetary embryos like Vesta. Um, but it's, it's likely that its large size um, uh, was, was a big factor in the fact that it, it still exists today. If I could add something, too. Uh, Vesta is basically a leftover planetary building block. Uh, what's happened to a lot of the bodies that probably resembled Vesta in the early solar system is that they have already been incorporated later into planets, into the, the growth of planets. So uh, this, in this way, this allows us to see farther back in time, which is, of course, the, the, the basis for the name Dawn of the mission. This is a mission in time as well as in space. Our next question is from Ken Kramer. 
Spaceflight Magazine. Ken? Hi, thanks for taking my question. Great results. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, uh, evidence. Is there any evidence elsewhere in the solar system of this, this massive impact uh, one billion years ago? And what consequence could that have been for the Earth? Thanks. Um, okay, I think the um, uh, the impact on Vesta was probably not part of a solar system wide phenomenon. I think it was just a sort of a single impact on Vesta that happened to occur at that time. Um, unlike, um, for example, the late heavy bombardment, which um, is a um, sort of a one of the models for the bombardment history of the Moon and the inner solar system, where a lot of um, a lot of impacts occur, say around uh, four billion years to three and a half billion years ago. Um, so this wasn't necessarily part of that. I think it was just sort of a, a later stochastic impact that happened to occur um, at that time. Okay. Um, in terms, oh, of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah. In terms of the um, the effect on the Earth, um, it's it's hard to say because it would have launched a lot of meteorites um, into space that would eventually make their way to Earth. So there might have been an increased um, number of, of meteorites falling on Earth, um, but in terms of, uh, of large impacts, like extinction-level extinction impacts, um, I don't think the, the best impact would have had any effect like that. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, incorporating something new here in our science uh, briefings, and that is bringing in the incredible reach and audience of social media. So I'm going to ask Carol to, to drive the bus here. I've, I've, we've got several questions coming in. And for our social media audience, forgive me if I uh, bought some of the names. They have some colorful names here that they're coming from. But uh, do my best, and, and Carol will divvy out the questions as you see fit. Welcome, social media audience. And the first one is from at Rye in Space. What is the predicted mineralogy of Vesta now, and what are the regolith and dust deaths? Um, who wants to take that? Christine? For the record, I think uh, Dave uh, for the mineralogy. Mm -hmm. So concerning the mineralogy, you, we have uh, uh, evidence of uh, silicatic uh, mineralogies, uh, pyroxene, different kind of pyroxene that are um, uh, especially uh, magnesium iron rich pyroxene. While um, we do not have uh, large evidence for other um, blocks of uh, different kinds of minerals. Concerning the regolith, I think that Dave can say something more. Okay, um, I don't um, have a good global estimate off the top of my head. Um, one number that I, I can give, though, is that um, in the, uh, the region around the Rhea Silvia impact basin, uh, we've estimated from the, the sizes of craters that have been erased by the formation of Rhea Silvia that the ejecta blanket over that region is maybe about five kilometers thick. That's about um, three miles thick. Um, so that wouldn't necessarily be fine powdery regolith. A lot of it might be large blocks, but it would be sort of a, a lot of, of rubble and, and smaller material that would be thrown over that area. Let, let me add something about the mineralogy. Uh, the HEDs tell us that another major mineral that should occur on the surface is feldspar, a plagioclase feldspar. And uh, we don't have an instrument that is capable of seeing that. Um, so this is a place where um, the, the meteorites are providing additional information uh, that will complement what we get from remote sensing. Another thing that we see, another mineral that we see in some of the uh, of the HED meteorites is the mineral olivine. Um, its presence is important because if we actually ex ex excavate down into the mantle of this body, we expect to see a lot of olivine. And we see small amounts of olivine in the HED meteorites, but our instruments have not yet allowed us to see olivine on the surface of Vesta, and we're looking hard for it, but we haven't found it yet. Okay, again, a reminder, send your question in to hashtag AskNASA. And again, the conversation doesn't stop there. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and in particular, and I'll give you the Twitter feed now and again at the end of the program, follow the conversation at NASA underscore Dawn, at NASA underscore Dawn. Next question from our hashtag AskNASA is from at LW underscore RDCP. What is the importance 
of today's discoveries for future investigation. Well, uh, I can offer my opinion. Um, <laughs> What we're seeing at Vesta is uh, has has really expanded the um, the ideas about the the diversity that we might encounter as we go out uh, into the asteroid belt and start looking at um, the myriad uh, pieces that might be um, providing us additional information about the early solar system. And you know, Ceres is an, is extremely interesting body um, that. We're already going to and, and studying, and so that um, is is one uh, is going to be an, an, another piece of um, the puzzle. But there are many uh, asteroids that have uh, interesting surfaces, from, as seen from telescopes. Um, there are many um, relationships of the types of asteroids you encounter with distance from the sun, which is is also telling us something fundamental about the gradients in the material and uh, the types of processes like collisional processes that are occurring. So um, the, what we're learning from VESTA that's honing our, our knowledge of the dynamics and of the, um, the, the possibilities of what these surfaces might hold is going to help us to formulate um, strategies for how we, we can you know, narrow down to the few bodies that we want to go um, explore in detail later. And, and I'll also mention, um, and others may want to chime in, that the telescopes are still extremely important for us because um, they right now are, are really our eyes on the solar system. We, we, we don't have the resources to send spacecraft out to, to many bodies. So they're going to still be the workhorses to, to really um, reveal more information about all of the uh, bodies out there. Yeah, I just want to add that. Uh we did a lot of observations of Vesta using the NASA Infrared Telescope facility prior to arrival. And one of the things is that, like Carol said, we cannot go to every asteroid out there. But if you have ground truth of confirmation of what we see from the Earth versus sending you know, a big spacecraft out there, we can do similar things with other objects. You know? So there's about a million asteroids. We can study them from the Earth, and we can extrapolate. We can know the differences of what are the limitations of what we can do. So, so far, it's really exciting to see that a lot of our observations that we made with the IRTF have been confirmed by Don. So it's a really important discovery. Another possible payoff, although it's arguable, is that uh, eventually we'll have the ability to mine asteroids, that we will find valuable resources on them. There was an article in uh, the USA Today uh, about that. Um, I think it's a tough sell, but there are people who are putting large amounts of money into this idea, and it will be interesting to see if this might have a payoff in the future, but certainly, uh, Missions like Dawn that characterize the materials in asteroids are obvious precursors before we send out spacecraft that are going to try to bring materials back for commercial purposes. Okay, we're going to uh, take a question from a reporter who sent in from uh, at NASA, and then we're going to go to the phone lines again. I believe Ken Kramer has another question, but this question is directed to Dr. Jim Green from the BBC correspondent Jonathan Amos Sr. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jonathan Amos, the science correspondent at BBC. Uh, Dr. Green, just an extra two weeks at Vesta would enable the Dawn team to fully image the North Pole. Will you give it to them? <laughs> well, of course, uh, it is a new Dawn in that uh, we have allowed that extension to occur. Um, it, 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 there was a critical analysis that went on that allowed us to make that decision very easy. And that is the fact that we can make it to Ceres, which is a major part of the mission. Uh, as you know, Ceres is a, sort of in the outer part of the uh, asteroid belt. Dawn is in the inner part of the astro asteroid belt, and the dynamics are such that um, uh, those things continually move apart. And with Dawn's ion engines that are running much better than predicted, that really enables us uh, to stay at, uh, stay at Vesta longer. So we're very excited about that because it will map that unknown region. Yeah. That region now is very important to look at because now we know about the Rhea Silvia impact and how that might affect the northern hemisphere will now be revealed. So indeed, um, it was an easy decision to make because the, the spacecraft is far more capable than, than its baseline and, 
and we're really excited about that next uh, that next step for Dawn. Thank you, Dr. Green. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone lines, and then we'll come back for a few more questions before we wrap up, and we're going to go back to Ken Kramer from Space Flight Magazine. Ken? Okay, thanks. Actually, one of my questions was about the extended mission, So, but let me ask a little bit differently. Uh, I believe you've been given 40 days. Can you talk about what you'll be doing in the 40 days? And I would like to know specifically about the illumination of the North Pole. <clears throat> Excuse me. Will it be fully illuminated or partially illuminated? And uh, my second question is, and you may have touched on this, I'm sorry, talk a little bit about any evidence for um, – uh, material that you've seen excavated from the deep interior, not the first few meters, but I'm talking about miles deep, maybe to the core. Do you see any evidence for that? Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to answer the, the first question. Um, as, as Jim already uh, uh, discussed, we did already extend uh, the mission uh, significantly, about 40 days, without any impact on the mission timeline. And that is allowing us to do uh, mapping later than was previously planned. That's going to achieve illumination um, to about um, 85 degrees um, north latitude at the same resolution as we've been discussing today. Um, there will be a, a small area at the very um, uh, north pole which will only be imaged a little bit later when it becomes illuminated adequately um, at a lower resolution. But um, the expectation is, if everything goes as planned, um, there will not be any um, unilluminated uh, areas of VESTA um, th that are left behind. And I, I will uh, answer to the second part of the questions. We, um, we see deep in the crust of Vesta, and uh, we see um, all the structure in the Rea Silvia, uh, Rea Silvia Basin, that is several miles uh, across the crust. And uh, we are looking to, to search for evidence of mantle material. I have to say that we uh, concluded the low uh, orbit mapping phase a uh, few days ago. These uh, data are for concerning, especially concerning the mapping spectrometer, are concentrated in the, in the south polar basin. And we need to look at this data carefully because those data has the highest resolution. And because we expected to uh, have some materials for, from the mantle, but in a, a limited quantity, uh, this is what we uh, saw in the meteorites. We need to have a larger resolution as possible. So I think that the only way to detect uh, eventually this kind of uh, mantle material is uh, uh, going into, into detailed analysis of this last uh, acquired uh, data. Okay, I'd just like to add uh, a quick point that even uh, with the best resolution, one of the things Hap pointed out was that the, in, the, in the meteorites itself, the evidence for mantle material comes from this olivine. It is comparatively less when you look at it, even in the HED collection. So one of the reasons why we don't see olivine is the fact that there's probably very little of it exposed. The second factor is that even if it was exposed a billion years ago, we have subsequent impacts that mixed it up with the surface. Now you see this, the footprint size, the best resolution we can get even with the framing camera is about 16 meters a pixel. So this olivine footprint has to be substantially larger than what we can resolve to be able to clearly, distinctly see it. You know, if you have an image that's 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels across, trying to identify one single pixel, there might be a you know, 16, 20 meter unit of olivine exposed on the surface. So it's a lot more challenging. So like Christina said, we need better resolution. But as far as your question goes, whether we see anything from beyond the mantle, the answer is no, so because that's why we still have the asteroid intact. Okay, we're going to uh, do a couple more. I want to first of all thank our social media. Your questions are coming in fast and furious, and I'm not going to get to all of them. But remember, the conversation doesn't stop here today. Follow the Twitter feed at, at NASA underscore Dawn. The science team members are ready to answer your questions. We're going to take a couple of more, but remember, follow us at at NASA underscore Dawn. Send in your questions if I don't get a chance to ask them. This next question is for Dr. Green again. From CS, I'm sorry, at S Observer, at S Observer. Will NASA be looking at perhaps using VESTA 
as a target for possible human exploration? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, the asteroid belt is well beyond the orbit of Mars. And uh, of course, uh, the administration and NASA is very excited about the plans for human exploration to leave low Earth orbit. And um, uh, consideration of going uh, to um, asteroids is really limited to more near Earth objects, things that are much closer than Vesta. Um, in the long run, um, I would love to see humans trek out of the solar system well beyond Mars. And perhaps the observations from Vesta that we're making today will allow uh, future generations to think of the importance that Vesta might play in that exploration. Uh, but that will be well into the future. Thank you, sir. Okay, this uh, next question is from at Sky and Telescope. So uh, I'm going to need your help here, Carol, to drive the bus here. Given the confirmation of Vesta's connection to HEDS heads, do you expect to find meteorite analogs after seeing Ceres up close? Boy, I wish. Um, it would make the exploration of Ceres a lot easier if we thought we had pieces in hand that could help uh, guide our interpretations and even help calibrate our instruments. Um, we thought about it, but uh, and there are some classes of meteorites that might be similar. Uh, the carbonaceous chondrites come to mind, but um, we don't believe, we don't have any, ev any, any reason to believe that uh, any of the meteorites in our collections now actually derive from Ceres. Yeah, I'd, I'd also like to add, too, that um, Vesta is in a unique position because we had this very large impact, multiple large impacts at the South Pole. Um, when we look at the distribution of asteroids in the main belt, there's these uh, Vesta asteroid family members that stretch uh, from Vesta to several resonances, and these resonances are essentially dynamical pathways to Earth. Uh, we don't see a similar thing when we look at Ceres. There doesn't seem to be a dynamical family associated with it that's got that convenient escape route to bring things to Earth. Okay, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to do two more here because the, these questions are, are, are fantastic. And again, thank you for joining us, social media audience, and we'll see you again. Um, from at Jurobin1997, is the concentration of minerals extraordinary? New, extraordinary, surprising. Mm, yes. Hmm. Yes, in some sense, it's uh, absolutely extraordinary the fact that uh, we are able to recognize uh, uh, mineralogical mm, region well defined. So uh, I think that uh, um, it's really surprising the fact that uh, having Vesta so ancient, so with a, um, a lot of uh, uh, cratering event, a lot of uh, resurfacing of the surface, we are still able to see uh, concentration of minerals in particular places of Vesta. So I think that uh, is really surprising also because all the other asteroids that uh, has been visited so far are more or less uh, uniform. Also Lutetia that uh, we visited uh, not, uh, not uh, a long time ago is a large asteroid because it's uh, 100 kilometers uh, asteroids. And uh, in any case, it's, it, its surface is, is completely uniform. So Vesta is really, really a surprise. Do you have anything to say? No, okay. OK, last one is from at Gabriella Retat. And I hope I got that right, Gabriella. If Vesta made the same start as Earth-like planets, why did it not develop into a planet? Um, oh, made the same start? Oh, uh, start, yeah. Do you want to? Oh, OK, so if they started in the same way, why did they not? Um, well, the um, part of it is given Vesta's location in the asteroid belt. Um, the asteroid belt is very close to Jupiter, and Jupiter is a very powerful gravitational influence. Um, so in the inner solar system where um, Earth, Venus, Mars, and Mercury formed, um, things weren't really stirred up that much so that they were able to accrete together and form um, the terrestrial planets. In the asteroid belt, um, Jupiter basically stirred things up 
so much that they weren't able to easily accrete with one another. The velocities in the asteroid belt were really high, and the higher the velocity is, the harder it is for things to merge together under their own gravity. So there were probably many things like Vesta that were around where the Earth is now that are now part of Earth. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap it up here. And again, I apologize for not getting all of the questions from social media. But remember, the conversation doesn't end here. If you have any questions or any other observations or want to follow a conversation about these extraordinary results about Vesta from the NASA's Dawn spacecraft, follow the Twitter feed at, at NASA underscore Dawn. And of course, all of this information is available on www.nasa.gov slash Dawn. And for our various social media sites, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, it's all there. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the information about Vesta up close and personal. We thank you for joining us. Science never sleeps.